You can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. And we don't die because there's the old God Baby. Right, yeah, God Baby's got our back. Cool. Thank you, God Baby. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Chris explore the Dragon Age Keep and build a custom world state to export into the recently released Dragon Age Inquisition. Do a fallen warden and a self-loathing hawk leave a world worth playing in? The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to podcast number 16. That's right, this is number 16. Um, number 15 is lost forever, I'm afraid, but will live on forever in our hearts. Um, you know, we, we had some technical difficulties last week with uh, recording number 15. My uh, computer that I was recording on crashed, and we lost basically my entire half of the conversation. Um, so rather than re-record, we decided to make an article out of number 15, um, but we're still counting that as having been kind of a podcast, and so now we have the... Uh, the lost episode the mystery of the lost episode yes it's not so mysterious since we just explained it but um <laughs> those of you, the, you loyal listeners who uh who actually listen to the podcast you'll know why there's a uh, jump between 14 and 16 so there you go anyway um so i'm chris as usual and we're joined here today by jim yep i'm here too and uh we're going to open our conversation in kind of the uh the traditional way within when it's just the two of us um which is to talk about what we've been playing recently so jim what you uh what you've been up to uh well um bearing in mind the the lost uh lost podcast um i did finish playing jade empire awesome was something that we talked about a little bit uh jade empire is a bioware rpg that came out um between night of the republic and mass effect so it was kind of, it, I believe it came out in about 2005, so it was kind of that in-between stage. And that, um, was on, um, that was on Xbox, and I think they ported it to PC eventually, too, right? Yeah, yeah PC. Uh, it came out on Xbox and PC. Um, actually, a pretty cool game. Uh, it sort of takes place in this uh, mythical ancient China, you know, sort of delves into um, Chinese lore, has a lot of, like, um, sort of like the fantastical elements of Kung Fu mixed into the, uh, into the lore of the game. Gotcha. So it's pretty. It's a pretty interesting game. Um, I didn't really appreciate the fact that you could only bring with you one party member at a time. I found that very obnoxious. But other than that, I, I enjoyed the experience. Um, another game that I play. I've been playing recently. A couple of them. Um, I do not have either of the new consoles. Um, I have the PS4 and the Xbox One. Mm-hmm. But I keep seeing all these promos for Grand Theft Auto V. So it kind of got my. Um, sort of reignited my Grand Theft Auto V um, itch, so I've kind of gone back and started playing a little bit of Grand Theft Auto V, just um, replaying from the start, playing some of the old missions, uh, playing some of Grand Theft Auto Online, uh, which is actually pretty fun. So they, they fixed a lot of the problems that I had with GTA, uh, GTAO. Have you played any um, GTAO, Chris? Uh, I've not played any, actually. I played um, for an afternoon of five, um, and I wanted to wait until I bu- or wait to buy it until it was out on um, next-gen consoles, which now that it is out, um, I'll have to save up my pennies and grab a copy of that. Um, but a, no, I haven't played any online. It's a really fun game. I love the single player, honestly. And I'm one of those people that, even though I, I tend to get the, the Grand Theft Auto games, um, I also tend not to finish them because um, eventually I kind of lose interest. There's a lot of really cool things to do that are not uh, the main plotline related. And so after a while, I end up sort of putting it aside because I, I just don't care about the rest of the game. Um, and this one, uh, GTA V, was the first game that I actually went all the way through since Vice City, I oh, believe. Wow. Cool. But I really enjoy it. Uh, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed Five. I think it's definitely worth playing all the way through. Um, the new version looks pretty neat uh, with the, the first person mode. They have a whole bunch of different little, a little. I don't know if you've looked at some of the the add-ons they have. You can play as like a little dog or like a shark, and oh. <laughs> um, yeah, nice. it's, it's, it's it's mostly it's it's kind of um, uh, fluff related. Of course, there's a lot of uh, graphic enhancements, mm-hmm. um, uh, but there is also the first person mode, which is kind of neat to sort of check that out and see how it plays. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've never played it before, you're you're in for a treat. I really cool. do think. 
Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the the few hours that I played at five on the, uh, I think it was the PS3. Um, it was one of, it was either that or the Xbox 360. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, uh, I was impressed, you know, even for um, last gen, how good the uh, the graphics were. And then seeing the um, the trailer for the new one, um, it looks pretty awesome. So I'm, I'm interested to check it out for sure. Yeah, GTA O, when it first came out, was was kind of a mess to be honest it was it was uh very difficult to play through you couldn't really join it, it a lot of like the, the job joining system didn't really work uh gaining money was kind of broken for jobs mm. when you tried to join other players on heists um sometimes the, the joining wouldn't really work right or you wouldn't get the right amount of money or there'd be a whole bunch of different problems and, and they seem to have fixed a lot of those when I was playing through it. Of course, there's still the issue where there's a whole lot of griefing going on. Um, it is it is Grand Theft Auto, so you kind of have to take that as is. I mean, it's sort of like part of the part of the fun. Yeah, um, yeah. There's going to be griefing. Uh, one of the problems that I did have, I came back to the game, and I hadn't really played a, a lot of online when it first came out. So I thought, um, you know, I'll, I'll go in and I'll play some of it. And when I first loaded in, I had no weapons at all. And so I get into the game, I have no weapons, and of course, all the other people in the server have lots of weapons. Um, so you can imagine how I, I, I fared against people with fully automatic uh, assault rifles, <laughs> um, completely unarmed. Um, obviously, I didn't quite survive. Yeah. So, <laughs> <Nice. laughs> so yeah, it's, it's also kind of uh, challenging to get to a place where you can actually buy weapons, because you have to actually drive your car there, and good luck. So uh, there, there is that element. Um, it, it does take a little bit of um, kind of a learning curve to sort of get yourself into a right place. For some reason, I was in the middle of the desert all the way up in the, uh, the northern part of um, Los Santos, okay. way, out, way out of the city proper. Um, I, did you, you, you said you didn't play uh, GTA V. Did you play San Andreas? Um, no, actually, I didn't. My, the, the GTA I've spent the most time with, and actually my first exposure to the series was 4. Um, mm. So I still haven't beaten four myself. I, I think I'm about halfway through the story. Um, and I just kind of like got to a point where I stopped playing and haven't gone around to yeah. it again. But I, I don't blame you. I, I felt the same. I, honestly, with four, for me, I, I, I felt it was a little bit bland. I, I enjoyed it up to a point, but after a while, I kind of put it aside. Mm-hmm. Um, until five came along, honestly, uh, Red Dead Redemption was the one that I was saying you know, even though it's not even a GTA, I was saying it's kind of the best of that style of game. Sure, yeah. Uh, simply because I wanted to play through the story, and I was really invested in the story. Um, and 5 was the one that, for me, really got me into the story. Otherwise, I liked Vice City just because of the setting. You know, I, I'm, I'm a big 80s guy. I was kind of... I was born in the early 80s. I was sort of... You know, I kind of remember as a kid sort of idealizing that kind of, that sort of era because I was... I kind of grew up in the 80s, so yeah. to me, sort of being in that, you know, Miami in the 80s atmosphere, I like the film Scarface, so it's a big big inspiration for the game itself. Mm-hmm. So um, I was able to play through that game, but admittedly, it really wasn't any better than San Andreas, mm-hmm. uh, to be honest. And San Andreas, I mean, I think was fun up to a point, but it was like the other ones. It's fun up to a point, like 3 and like 4 and, and San Andreas. Fun up to a point, but after a while, it, it feels repetitive. Um, and some of the missions, uh, I, I don't know if you experienced this in four. You said that was the only game that you played, right? Um, aside from like those few hours of five, I think the okay. I got to the, I just cleared the first mission with the um, weird um, drug addict guy in the desert. Trevor. Trevor, yeah. The third character, which yeah. I love. I love that they have three characters in five. By the way, it's a great that is guy. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, which is of course a new thing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think one thing that five does really well, which the other earlier GTAs didn't really do, is they give you this um, like each of the missions. There was, there was always this, this this concept of these really obnoxious missions in Grand Theft Auto where mm-hmm. you just don't want to play them because they're the way that that the controls work. Um, you feel like you're kind of being cheated by the system, mm-hmm. and just it feels very frustrating. That that happened to me even in four a little bit. But especially with all the, the GTA 3 engine games, which were uh, 3, Vice City, and San Andreas, there were definitely some missions where I never wanted to redo them because I felt the controls were terrible. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> G- GTA 5, I, I really feel like, fixed a lot of that. And there's a lot of, for example, the driving, I think, is, is really tight compared to the other games. Mm-hmm. Which you'd be surprised. You, you would think a game that's called Grand Theft Auto would have a good driving system since that's a big part of the game, but it really hasn't, to be honest, until uh, recently. 
So I, I feel that, that that coupled with um, the way that, that the combat engine works, uh, the way that, that you move is a lot smoother, transitioning between uh, shooting different enemies and the way that you aim and all that, mm-hmm. is just, just handled so much better. So I, I really do think that that is a big part of why I wanted to play all the way through GTA V versus some of the other ones. Gotcha. It's just the experience is more enjoyable in general. It's easier to want to keep playing because it just it feels good. Yeah, it's a more refined experience. I, I, I love the concept of having this you know open world city, this living environment. And, and really the big criticism that I still have for GTA, and you'll probably experience this too, you might have experienced it, it, it in 4, and hopefully with GTA 6 they can fix this because they'll have the processing power to do it with these next-gen systems, is there's still a lot of buildings that you can't enter. Yeah. And that yeah, kind that, of breaks the immersion. Weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like if I'm in this really large city and I go to a building, I can understand a few of them being closed for various reasons, but I should be able to enter about 75-ish percent of all the buildings in the city if I want to make, if I, if I want it to feel like a real city, I should be able to enter those buildings. Um, even if they're protected by security and the second I walk in, I get shot, I should still feel like I could enter it yeah. potentially. Yeah, I've always felt like too, it's like I, I'd be... It, this would kind of work well for sort of a um, uh, dystopian sort of setting where you've got this world where like everything is very much prefab. But I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'd understand if like you know all of the houses, for instance, like you maybe have like three or four houses that look exactly the same whenever you go inside. It just becomes a matter of like for tactical reasons. While I'm in the middle of this chase, I want to run into this house and hide or something like that. Um, oh yeah. It would, it, would, it would be nice to be able to actually enter buildings and then like you said i think the city would feel much more complete much more like an immersive um full living city um as opposed to just being like you know the three houses that i'm allowed to go into or even big office buildings um it'd be great to have like these multi-level sort of fights that could be happening in office buildings um even if it does all look the same floor to floor building to building etc and and they kind of have those for missions, so you still have that that experience, but you just don't have it organically. Mm-hmm. Except for there, there's certain buildings you can enter. It's just there's not many. Um, you can still there. There's certain. Um, it's not. I don't think they're called Seven Eleven or the twenty twenty four seven shops, but there's similar shops where you can go in and they sell um, you know liquor and basic things. You can go in there. You can hold them up. You can you know hold the gun on the person behind the counter mm-hmm. and make him give you whatever's in the cash register, and then you can run out and you know escape. So they do have that sort of element to it, mm-hmm. but those buildings are few and far between. There's so many that you can't enter. Right. And it would be really neat if, for example, like you said, you're running from the cops and you want to run into, say, an office building um, and sort of dare the cops to, to run into the office building with all those people in there and try to take you out. Mm-hmm. That's kind of part of the fun. I mean, you're supposed to be this completely reckless um, criminal yeah. who... who you, that would be something that's actually kind of smart to do if you're a very reckless criminal. Hide um, kind of in plain sight, but also kind of use um, the people around you as sort of like a shield. Mm-hmm. It, it'd be sort of like an interesting element to add to the games. We'll see where they go with, with uh, 6. They added, uh, really did sort of take a big step forward with 5 in terms of narrative and in terms of um, the, the three characters and having such a big difference in terms of like the size of the world and having all these very a lot of variety in terms of the missions that you can take cool i don't want to get too far into it you'll you'll enjoy it i don't want to reveal too much but i do think you'll enjoy it yeah no it sounds cool definitely yeah so recently what i've been playing is uh you know smash bros came out uh just earlier this weekend which is pretty awesome oh um, yeah so smash bros for the wii u and uh it's just about as amazing as we all could have hoped uh the graphics are really nice the roster is um the same as the 3ds i mean i've actually by now i made sure i um cleared all of the uh, challenge panels on the 3ds version Mm -hmm. um so while there's still you know more stuff that i can collect and unlock and that sort of thing as far as items for characters um i've pretty much fully experienced the 3ds version and now it's more kind of like my you know handheld um on the go sort of version of smash bros now that i have the console um, but yeah, no, Smash Bros. is uh, pretty awesome so far. The eight-player Smash is um, awesomely chaotic. Um, it, let, lots let, of... me put, let me put you on the spot here, Chris. Okay, sure. Who is your main in Smash Bros. so far? Um, it's the same as it was for Brawl, and that's Ike. 
Really? So yep. same same line. So do you think that Ike got better or worse, or is he about the same? He's about the same. Um, they did change the feel of all the gameplay in general to make it feel more like melee. Um, mm. So everything, it's a little bit more ground-based now. Um, everything moves a little bit quicker. Um, they teamed up with Namco Bandai, or Bandai, Bandai to um, uh, produce the game which um, is cool because they have a lot of experience with Tekken and Soul Calibur and other franchises like that. Um, so they know fighting games pretty well. So they were able to take the um, Smash Bros um, play style, which has become you know pretty popular in tournaments, especially Melee and uh, Project M, which was the, uh, the fan-made um, mod for Brawl. Yeah. Um, they were able to take that and like really hone down the mechanics, make everything balanced and smooth, and it just it looks great, it runs great. Um, I think it's going to become the new standard for um, tournament play, which is cool. Um, so I'm just really excited to see. Um, uh, th- they've been posting updates with uh, character balance tweaks and stuff like that when needed. Um, so I think it's going to be a really well supported game for a while now, and I'm pretty excited about it. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, I played the demo for the 3DS version. Mm-hmm. Um, I was considering getting that. Do you do you recommend the 3DS version for people that may not yet have a Wii U, or do you think they should hold off? Oh, no, I definitely recommend it. Um, and actually, there are quite a few perks for having both versions if you do eventually get the Wii U one. Um, for instance, if you register both games with Club Nintendo, you get um, a free soundtrack. Um, you also get um, free Mewtwo DLC. They're going to be adding that in um, hmm. early 2015. Um, but yeah, no, definitely I recommend it. Um, it's it's designed to play um, the same. All the characters like have the same um, uh, stats, if you will, like as far as like how quickly they move, how long the attacks take. Um, like everything is tuned to be the same across both versions. So that while the graphics um, are obviously a pretty big difference, um, the the game's going to play the same way. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't actually have a Wii U yet. Um, part of that is money issues obviously sure, yeah. um, but I, I do definitely think that uh, uh, Smash Bros would be kind of like a day one purchase when I do get a Wii U definitely um, it's definitely a game that seems like it has a lot of, of life to it you can play it for, for many hours uh, you did say that you played the um, the 8 player Smash Bros mm-hmm. uh, 8 player Smash um, that's localized only right local multiplayer on them um that I'm not sure about. I do know that, for instance, they're adding a tournament mode um, later on to the Wii U version. Um, mm-hmm. So it's not available at launch, and that's been kind of a standard feature since Melee. Um, it is going to be coming eventually, so even if 8-player online isn't available now, there's a chance it could be later. Um, I haven't tried. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm only, I've am only i only been aware of 4-player online, um, or 2 or 4, um, but I haven't seen 8 yet, but I... Would not be surprised if there is a player. Um, I just imagine though there might be issues with latency and stuff like that, so it could also be that it's just localized. Hmm. When you play eight player, um, are you completely open to you could have um, eight human players, you could have like six human players and two computers, or one human player and seven computers? Is it completely open in terms of? the way that you split that up yeah completely open um and what's cool about it too is that the uh the game supports a whole bunch of different um control types so um you've got obviously the game pad that comes with the wii u um you can use any um wii remote or anything that plugs into a wii, wii remote so all your stuff from the wii that you had you can use um Nintendo released a, um, a GameCube controller adapter you can plug into the Wii U so you can actually use your GameCube controllers, which a lot of people yeah. really like when they play Smash Bros. Um, even your 3DS can be um, connected to your Wii U and you can use your 3DS as a controller. Um, oh, so, cool. so say, for instance, you know you have a friend who brings their GameCube controller, and then like for me, for instance, I've got my gamepad and my Wii U Pro controller. Um, so that's three right there. And then another friend can bring their 3DS, and so that's a fourth controller. Um, I could pull out all Wii U controller or all Wii controllers. And um, I've got like, you know, four of those. And whether it's just the controller by itself or it's got an attachment or a nunchuck, um, I, I already have in my possession at least eight controllers, if not more. Um, and people can bring their own. Uh, so it's really, it's really cool that it's uh, very flexible as far as what they'll actually let you play with to make sure you can get those eight players in. Cool. That's actually really neat because that's one of the modes that I thought was really um, interesting to me. That I, I know that I've I've been to various parties. I know you have too, where there's a lot of people around that uh, would like to play Smash Bros. Only four can play at a time. So yep. the fact that you now have the possibility to play with eight, um, but you don't necessarily have to play with um, 
you know, eight humans, you can sort of mix and match between computerized opponents is mm-hmm. pretty cool. I, yeah. I really like that. Because then if you have, like, say, five people, seems like an odd number. You can always do sort of mix and match. I assume that you can do team-based as well. Like, you could do, could you do, like, um, four teams of two, for example? Yes, you could. They've actually... Um They've added, it used to just be that you had, you know, three teams because that's really the most you can have with four players is three different teams. They had red, blue, green before. Mm -hmm. Um, Now they've added yellow team. Um, And in addition to being able to, like, mix and match how many computers you have, you can actually just have, say, five players if you want. Um, So you go into eight-player smash mode, but you can actually turn off several slots just like you always could with the four-player smash. Um, Mm -hmm. So you could just have, like, you know, that the odd man out who would just have to, like, you know, play winner or loser dropout or whatever it was. Um, Now they get to actually just jump in, and it's not a problem. So it's really pretty great that they've added that feature. That is pretty neat. I think um, I've heard a lot of a lot of good things about this this particular version of Smash. I've heard people say that it is uh, the best version so far, the best Smash game. What do you where do you rate on that? Oh no, I definitely agree with that. Um, I was one of those few people that actually thought that Brawl was better than Melee. Um, and part of that's just because I didn't really play super competitively like some people do. Um, mm-hmm. I just like that you know the graphics were better and there was more stages, more uh, items, and more characters and all that sort of stuff. So I just thought it's a natural step up. Um, this does that as well, and I think it satisfies all the people who liked mm-hmm. the gameplay to be more like Melee. Um, well, so I think it's like the best of every world in this case, and it's just kind of the definitively this is the best Smash yet. So. Well, let me ask you this, because I, I personally preferred uh, the N64 Smash, ah, gotcha. uh, possibly the most controversial choice. <laughs> uh, actually, no, probably Brawl would be. But um, the reason that I did, though, was because I really liked uh, the way that uh, the throw system was set up in the, the original. Um, and they kind of made throwing, they sort of like um, de-emphasized throws in the later versions. Uh, Melee, in particular, had a terrible system for throwing. Have they changed the way that throws are set up uh, in the new Wii U version, or is it the same as Brawl, or did it go back to the Melee version where it's almost irrelevant to throw someone? Um, I think it's definitely relevant to throw someone. Um, some characters have better throws than others. Like, you know, if some, some throws might be more just to do damage. Some throws are yeah. more to throw them um, and, like, get that, like, KO um, ability. <laughs> Um, I don't. It might not be as powerful as the N64 version. It's been a while since I've played it, so I can't really compare. Um, but I do know that a lot of people actually ca- count throws as a vital part of their strategy. And actually, now more than ever, um, there are a lot of characters now that have counter moves. Um, one of the best ways to counter people who are counter happy is to grab them, um, hmm. because they can't counter grabs. Um, right. So if you have someone who's countering a lot or um, guarding a lot, um, grabs are a great way to get past defenses really quickly. So. That's really cool. I'm actually glad they kind of did that. That was, that was my biggest complaint in Melee, in mm-hmm. particular, was that the um, the way that grabs uh, and throws work uh, had been so nerfed that it kind of made them almost irrelevant unless you had a character that had um, one of those uh, sort of glitch grabs where you could grab people sort of infinitely if you timed it right. Oh, yeah, yeah. There were a couple <laughs> characters that had that, which uh, that's kind of an exploit, and that wasn't really what I was looking for. Yeah, I'm not uh, I just kind of wanted. Yeah, I just kind of wanted it to be a viable option, which I think Brawl sort of brought back, but not quite to what I was hoping for. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of glad that, that the new Wii U version, at least from what you're explaining, seems to sort of be this happy medium between... Um, maintaining the competitive atmosphere of melee but also giving you um a little bit more variety uh that you may have been given in brawl even mm-hmm. though brawl kind of because i know that brawl kind of added a few things like for example the uh stripping mechanic which mm-hmm. as far as i know has been removed from the, the, it has, right, the it has been trip. removed yeah and that was a pretty controversial and I, I hated that too admittedly i really didn't like that mm-hmm. um so i'm kind of glad they sort of moved away from that sort of party I don't know, casual mode, whatever the heck that was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know who thought that was a good idea to begin with, to be honest. Yeah, I think um, I, I could sort of see their logic with the tripping thing. The idea was that if you had like totally mismatched players, um, it was a way that you can add like one more element that like you never know if you might trip. Um, so I, I guess in a way, it would also it was a bit of an exploit sort of breaker in a way, um, but. Yeah, I don't know. It's just the fact that it was random. I think threw it off. If if it was like more likely to ha- more likely to happen in certain scenarios, certain situations, yeah. Um, or like for instance, if they know that like this is prone to being exploited, this like mechanic in particular, um, then we can put a trip more likely to happen in that case. Um, but no, it's just yeah. It 
it, it, well, I could understand some of the logic behind it. Um, it it's not worth it. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm glad they so, took it out. So before we move on, one final question about Smash Bros. Sure. Uh, <laughs> as long as we haven't lost anyone, uh, Smash Bros. Talk. Um, uh, I, I don't think anyone will tune away from Smash Bros. Talk. So, <laughs> so if, if which character, like, if you see, like, you know, I'm playing, say I'm playing Smash Bros. against you and I'm picking a character, uh, which character, if I'm picking it, you're playing your main character, you said it was Ike, mm -hmm. um, and which character could I pick that you would go, oh, crap, he's picking that one. That's the one I least want to play against. Uh, you know, it's tr it's hard to, to name a single character. Um, because it really depends on who I'm playing against and what their kind of their strengths are. Um, mm -hmm. I used to say that it was any fast character um, because the fast character can get in and hit me before I could hit them. Mm -hmm. um, but I've refined my strategy enough that I'm actually able to um, better play the range game, the evasion game, um, get in with a few like you know quick light hits and then follow up with heavier attacks. Um, and the thing that I like about Ike too is that even though he's a slow character, he's heavy hitting enough that I don't need to have you as at a high a percentage in order to KO you if I time it right. Um, so mine's kind of like a risk reward style of play. Mm -hmm. um, so I won't say there's a specific character, but I do know like for um, you know a friend of mine, like you know, say if their main is Pikachu and they pick Pikachu, I'm like, oh crap, because Pikachu is quick and they know how to play them really well. Um, so it, it really depends. All right, so Pikachu, that's who I'm playing. <laughs> if, if we play against each other, I'm pick. I'm playing Pikachu. Um, well, any uh, any ranged character too will give me a tough time. <laughs> if you can keep me at bay, um, I have very few um, close in abilities. So um, that's another thing you can keep in mind. Okay, cool. Um, As I give you advice on how to defeat me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. I I have not even played the Wii U version, so that's that's a, a whole other thing. I've only done the demo for 3DS, but um, I definitely like what I'm hearing about the game, so I, I'm certainly excited to try it out when I do have the chance to get a Wii U. Awesome. All right, so uh, another game that came out recently was uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, um, which I have picked up. I haven't been too far into it yet. Um, I don't know, were you planning on playing that at some point, Jim? Uh, yeah, I was actually planning to, but uh, money's a little tight, so I don't want to pick it up just yet. Wait, Maybe wait for a price drop or possibly um, wait for uh, Christmas time. Gotcha. Um, but we thought that uh, because the game just came out, it might be fun to go through the uh, Dragon Age Keep, uh, which for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a tool, um, an online tool that BioWare put together to um, allow you to customize your uh, your world state from Dragon Age Origins to Dragon Age 2, um, basically going through all your decisions that you made, um, and then import that um, world state into uh, Dragon Age Inquisition to replace whatever default state um, they give you if you don't do that. Um, so I think it's a pretty cool concept. Apparently there were some issues with uh, um, importing save files from the previous games they just uh, decided to use this as a way to um, get around those issues that they were having um, so it doesn't import your save files the only thing it'll really import is uh, you know your character's name the little uh, avatar portrait um, but beyond that it, um, it it's up to you to basically customize it but it's cool because if you um, wanted to change one or two decisions that you made that you didn't uh, like making the first time through you don't have to play all the way through the game again to change it. you just have to tweak a couple of the choices which I think is pretty neat do you think this is sort of just the general question before we get started sure. do you think that this kind of removes a little bit of the mystery for people that may not have played Origins or, Dra or Dragon Age 2 um, I think it will to an extent. Um, I actually found, though, that uh, the context that they provide in here, and there are other places that um, will give you more context and more detail, actually, um, this idea I got um, from PC Gamer, they did this really great like two-hour video where these guys sat down and talked you through every single decision in the keep, which we won't be doing today. Um, but they uh, they explained everything pretty in depth. I think though that um, while there might be a few sort of spoilers as far as like you know what can happen and um, uh, that sort of thing, there, there's there's a little bit of mystery removed. But I think that it doesn't tell you enough to make playing the games obsolete, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm honestly, I think this will be kind of a refresher for me because. Um, I played all the way through Origins, but it's been a while, and I never really got all the way through uh, Dragon Age 2, Right, as we mentioned. Yeah, and I, um, I actually lost my... Um, I never got all the way through Dragon Age 2. I got through most. Um, I did play through Origins, but all my save data actually got lost in this big uh, memory wipe that I had on my PS3. Um, so I really enjoy that they have this now because I can... Um, 
you know, get all my uh, my decisions back the way I wanted them to without having to play through the games one more time, which is really nice. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to um, we're basically going to be creating a backward compatible world state, and uh, when we're done, we should be able to share this with you guys, and um, you can actually import this into Inquisition and let us know how it goes. Um, so our character concept, I believe, um, you and I both played at one point, Jim. I recall um, uh, we played through Origins as a human. Uh, um, warrior, was that correct? Uh, yeah, um, I, I played through Origins um, actually twice, although I don't think my second playthrough I got all the way through. And I was a um, noble warrior, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then another time I played through as a um, a mage. Okay. If I remember right. Might have been a dwarf. I think. It's been a while. It wouldn't have been a dwarf mage. Um, dwarves don't have magic in this universe. No, right, yeah. It would not, have, uh, not a dwarf mage, but just a dwarf. The reason mm -hmm. I say that is because um, I have played through several RPGs as a dwarf, so it seems like something I may have done. I just uh -huh. don't remember doing it. <laughs> cool. All right, well, uh, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, so we're going to set up um, our hero real quick. So uh, from the tapestry, we're going to click on uh, hero. Um, we'll go ahead and make our character uh, Aiden Kuzland. He's just kind of the default human male warrior. And then uh, kind of the first big decision we're going to be making here is uh, Warden Alive and Well. Um, so our character concept that we're kind of working from uh, is that we have this sort of human noble. They have the idea that he's fairly idealistic to start, but then maybe over time uh, starts to make a few um, poor decisions by the end. Uh, might not be this uh, knight in shining armor, maybe more of a uh, morally questionable character. Um, so as far as whether the Warden's alive and well, um, we have the choices... Um, he is, or basically he died killing the Archdemon. I think that there are actually some interesting things we can do, and you know, feel free to chime in on this, Jim, um, if we make sure that he's alive and well, because then we can sort of decide how it is that he didn't die killing the Archdemon. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Another thing that we might want to do is um, let's go ahead and select alive, because that's my initial uh, thought as well, but then mm -hmm. let's return to this choice after we go through the rest of them to cool. see if maybe um, we've changed our mind. Cool. And uh, it's worth noting, too, that actually if we decide later on um, that something that would result in him dying does happen, um, we can actually do that later on, and it will try to correct this decision later on. It will actually detect uh, conflicts automatically and make sure you don't pick anything that was impossible in the game. Oh, cool. So, All right, so we'll prove Warden alive and well, and we'll click on the uh, Dragon Age Origins thing in the top left to return to the tapestry. Um, let's go ahead and save companions for a little bit later. Um, because that's a lot of sort of details about um, the who's who and that sort of thing, which you might be able to decide after um, events. Um, so quickly, we'll uh, go to prologue. We'll go in and say that he bought food to pre feed this prisoner in Ostagar. Um, kind of a compassionate move. Um, and we'll say that he cured the Mabari Hound. Um, oh, so like I said, issues. we're going to be moving through this really quickly. Um, we're not really here to... Um, give you a lot of background on the uh, on the story, but uh, we will sort of deliberate um, and give details where we think it's more important. Now I'm at the, um, are we moving on to the urn of sacred ashes at this point? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Do you remember this particular uh, quest? I remember the grind that was the dungeon to uh, get to the urn. <laughs> oh, um, if, you, if you click on the little um, question mark at mm -hmm. the top in the middle, yeah. it gives you a little background. It says, a holy relic from the martyrdom of Andraste the founding figure of the Chantry, the urn of sacred ashes could be retrieved or profaned. Mm -hmm. And I believe the uh, the the profanity or the profaning um, is if you um, poisoned the urn um, based on the uh, request of some dragon cult or something like that. Um, I think this is fairly early in the story, if I recall. I think that our character would probably not poison the urn. No, that's that's too much of a dick move right off the bat. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll go with uh, the Certain of Sacred Ashes was not defiled. All right, so moving right along to the Arl of Redcliffe, which I believe is your first big uh, destination as you try to recruit um, people to combat the Blight, which and is we have a lot big. Of, and we have a lot of choices here, too. Whole yeah, bunch lots of, of stuff. Helped Redcliffe fight. Um, so I, I think that early on we probably would have, yeah. And um, I remember this, I, I completely remember this fight too, where you had a yeah. whole undead coming into the town and you're trying to figure out how to get them prepared for the fight. Right. Or directly participate or just leave them to their fate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I would say at this point we'd probably go in and help them fight, so we'll go with that answer. Plus, who doesn't like killing undead? 
yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun. <laughs> it's uh, gratifying in a way. Um, and so because we help them fight, I imagine we also help them prepare. So we'll go in and leave that as it is. Um, so Connor, um, I believe, is the son of the Arl, um, who uh, was um, possessed by a demon. He made a deal with a demon, which is always a great idea. Um, generally not advisable. So you guys out there listening, don't don't make deals with the demons. It never works out. Uh, ah, but it says, uh, yeah, he did it to save his uh, father, apparently. Yep. What, what stage should we say he's in? Are we going to say he died, um, that he's alive and not possessed? I think that's kind of the uh, the best scenario answer. Depending I, I would on actually say since since our character our, our character arc is uh, supposed to sort of um, poison the, the idealism that perhaps he was raised with, I think sure. that Connor should actually be dead. Like maybe mm. he, he kind of failed to um, free him from the possession, from the demon's uh, thrall. Cool. So I maybe like it's, it's already kind of pushing him in that direction of mm-hmm. – um, questioning his his motives. Cool. All right. So Connor died. <laughs> I mean, not that that's cool, but um, no, I, I like the uh, I like the direction. So, all right. Um, Bella leaving Redcliffe. Um, this is just a side quest, I guess. Um, um, is sold, which is uh, Connor's mother, I believe. Um, so either she's alive, or um, she sacrificed herself to try to save her son. Um, I'm not sure. It, it would actually be really actually, interesting. I'm sorry. Were you going to say that if it's if she sacrificed herself, it would be interesting because it, he, he ends up dying anyway? Yeah. So if she sacrificed herself and he died, it's kind of like, well, what is heroic sacrifice even worth? And I think that really sort of uh, feeds into our character concept. So mm-hmm. I, I really like that. Cool. So now we might have a conflict oh, on this one. Let's go says, ahead and say. It says... Um, so if, if she sacrifices herself, Connor has to be alive and not possessed. So that's one of our um, our error checks, if you will, the thing that automatically tells us that there's a conflict. Oh. See, I, I would think it would be much more interesting if she sacrificed herself, but it still failed. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, it looks like we can't make that choice. Apparently not. Um, so do you want to say that she's alive then? Uh, I guess we don't have a choice. All right. So a soul is alive. Congratulations. Bevan. Uh, Caitlin trying to find her brother. Um, this is one actually I would think that um, maybe we wouldn't waste too much time on. Um, I, I forget exactly what this quest was all about. Let's see. Uh, Caitlin, a young girl in the village of Redcliffe, was missing her brother Bevan in the chaos around the undead attacks. Um, I think we'd probably be too busy helping the town prepare to try to go out and hunt him down. I, I would say there's one option here that I think might possibly work. We've got one where you you basically just scare him back to the town. You don't go through a quest where you find him a sword and all that. All right. So instead of, it's a little bit, I guess you could say better than doing nothing, Mm -hmm. but it's also, you're not really putting a whole bunch of effort into it. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll go with that. So we uh, we scared Bevan back to the chain tree. Uh, The next big area was we uh, we go into this forest and we're trying to um, figure out what's up with these uh, these elves, these wood elves, and uh, werewolves, um, which elves were, I guess, turning into werewolves here. Nature of the beast, right? Yep, nature of the beast. So, uh, big decision of this one is, um, how did the warren resolve the problems between the werewolves and the elves? Um, so, the, the default answer that we have here is brokered peace, basically got it to the point where the werewolves and the elves joined our side. Um, sided with werewolves, or sided with the elves? So this is uh, a kind of, I guess we kind of have to determine uh, um, at what point along the path we're at. Um, the kind of um, roguish answer, I suppose, might be that we sided with the werewolves because we thought that they would be more um, a deadlier ally. And if we don't try to broker peace, that could be a thing. Um, it could also be that maybe we uh, we don't like monsters and we want to side with the elves, and so we wiped out the werewolves. Um. I would think, especially if we're going with a noble character that sort of has this idealistic notion of uh, morality, mm-hmm. that he would probably view werewolves as you know mindless monsters and would probably automatically be kind of biased against them. Mm-hmm. Uh, although the other thing to keep in mind is that um, elves in this universe are actually very um, oppressed. Uh, the Dalish are free because they're out in the wild and they're kind of uh, nomadic and they don't associate with humans all too much. Um, but city elves are um, kind of like left into um, uh, slums and stuff like that. Um, so I wonder if 
you know, our character doesn't necessarily need to feel the same way about elves, but I wonder if uh, that maybe is an aspect of the character we want to take into consideration. Um, yeah, I would think um, from that perspective that perhaps our noble, uh, even though he is a noble, he feels he feels like uh, he can sort of identify, not identify with, but he feels uh, empathy for the, or sympathy for the um, elves and their plight, and maybe he uh, supports them for that reason. Okay, um, so we're going to say that we sided with the elves, but we did um, we did not help the werewolves out. Did the Orden tell Athras about the fate of his wife, um, Danila? So, I think Danila was a um, a elf turned werewolf, um, and she wanted the Warden not to tell her husband about her fate. Given that she was a werewolf, and apparently we are not really siding with the werewolves, I think that we'd probably actually give the um, quote unquote normal elf the uh, the benefit here. And so maybe we did tell him about his wife's fate. So it's kind of hard to take, but he knows the truth and he can kind of deal with it now. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Cool. All right. So we did tell him. And we'll move on to Paragon of Her Kind. This is when you uh, go down into the uh, the dwarven city under the mountain and uh, are helping, helping to decide who the next king is going to be, among other things, which was, uh, this is a pretty interesting quest line, I thought. So, um, defeated Bronca. Bronca is a paragon. It's kind of a, um, a citizen uh, among the dwarves who's been exalted to this kind of venerated status um, because of her uh, great deeds or what have you. So they have a lot of sway in... Um, in politics and their culture and that sort of thing. Um, so the whole reason we're seeking her out is so that we can bring her back to the city and help her or have her basically be the tie-breaking vote on um, who the next king's going to be. So um, okay. when we find Bronca, we find her at this uh, the thing called the Anvil of the Void. Um, which let me go and read the context here. The Anvil of the Void was a powerful dwarven artifact once used to forge mighty war golems. Um, so I think they basically set this up as being um, kind of a very dangerous tool. Um, I think the idea too is, uh, and this is a place where not having enough context in the keep might throw people's uh, perceptions off. Um, but I believe that the golems were actually powered by um, human souls or you know dwarven souls, whatever it might be. Um, so like it's like oh it makes war golems that'd be great or it's like actually no it's stealing souls to make war golems so it's a little bit more uh, morally gray there. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't really um, I, I didn't remember the choice until you brought it up, but there's actually a, a very similar concept in Jade Empire as well with mm. uh, souls sort of powering golems. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not I'm not certain that was the case, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was, um, as I recall. So I just remember it was more complicated than they're making it out to be here. Um, but anyway, so our choices are um, Caradin, uh, which is the dwarf that we went with to look for Bronca, and the warden defeated Bronca and destroyed the Anvil of the Void, ending both the threat, threat it posed and the opportunity it represented. Eh, excuse me. Um, so part of that is kind of deciding, do we want to take advantage of this uh, tool or not? Um, kind of how do we feel about that? Um, the warden convinced Bronca that her quest for the Anvil is self-destructive. She ultimately destroyed it before ending her own life. Or uh, joining forces with the warden against Caradin, Bronca set out about covering the Anvil's dark secrets. Which so. seems like the the like best outcome, I suppose. I think it's um, that's basically the option. Is if we want to take advantage of the Anvil, um, we're basically allowing Bronca to research it and then learn how to use it. Um, oh, I see. Um, I don't know. This is an interesting interesting decision. Where do you think we're at right now? Um, I think that we're still in the sort of like learning transformative stage, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I would probably side towards Bronca um, ending her own life. Um, the more of these sort of events that happen to our character, the more he's going to be influenced and change over time. Okay. Um, so we're not saying that we're fighting against Bronca. We're saying that we, we convince her not to do it and then she just kills herself, which might be a bit scarring too. Yes, exactly. Cool. That's, at least that's what I'm, I'm thinking. Oh, I think that's a good idea. So, uh, Bronca ended her own life. That is our answer. All right, two rules Ozramar. Ozramar. Um, so we have Balin, uh, which is the uh, son of the former king. Um, I actually, in my, in my original playthrough, I, I chose him um, just because he seemed like he had the more legitimate claim to the throne. Although, apparently, there were... Um, some hints, especially if you played through the uh, the Dwarven origin, uh, the Dwarven noble, as opposed to like the human origin that we played through. Um, apparently, there was uh, some suspicion of foul play. 
and I think they mentioned that too when you visit the city regardless um, but I, yeah, I figure I, that that was just political maneuvering by someone who doesn't have a claim to try to um, take over the throne so I went ahead and went with him um, he tends to be more progressive um, he's actually trying to reconnect with the surface kingdoms mm-hmm. um, whereas uh, Harrimont who from what I understand is much less of a dick um, has is a lot more conservative, a lot more traditional, and he um, will probably end up keeping the dwarves underground. So, what are we uh, what are we thinking about here? I would say again on this choice, you know, going by our character arc, that we should probably go with uh, Balin, who at the time we thought was this great progressive leader, and then it turns out that he actually has more um, you know selfish schemes of his own. At least mm-hmm. that's that's what it, that's what the description says, and that's also the way you described it. Mm-hmm. And I kind of remember that too. So we kind of have this concept where we pick a guy for one reason, and it turns out maybe we made the wrong choice, but now it's too late. Cool. So we're uh, leaning toward Balin then. Yeah, I think so. Cool. All right, Balin, it is. So Paragon of a Kind is done. Uh, we're going to move on now to uh, Broken Circle, and this is where we uh, run into the mages and the Templars for the first time. Um, so basically, this this mage tower, the cir- circle tower, and uh, um, on a little island in this lake um, where they pin up all the mages so they can basically keep track of them. Um, it's worth mentioning in this uh, in this universe, if you're not familiar with it, that um, magic is very much um, playing with fire in this game. Um, using magic and becoming more powerful with it attracts demons, um, and eventually a mage can become uh, possessed and turn into an abomination um, that's this really powerful uh, magic-wielding thing that can wreak massive destruction. So as a result, people are very afraid of mages, and so they're allowed to exist, but only under the protection of these Templars. Um, essentially paladins, or something along those lines that are an order that's designed to you know, fight demons, fight monsters, and um, basically police mages. So we get to the uh, we get to the tower and we find out that it's been invaded. Um, a bunch of mages have turned into abominations, and the Templars want to storm in there and take out a bunch of them. Uh, so basically, we have to decide if we want to support the Templars in wiping out the mages, or do we want to try to protect the mages? Uh, well, given that we are, well, we're a warrior, though, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm, still, I'm still sort of leaning towards the mages here because it seems like the Templars are not really justified in this. Mm-hmm. They're, they're justified true? by right, technically, but yeah, no, they uh, they might be jumping the gun a little bit. I think that, yeah, I think at this point we would probably um, support the mages and try to save them if we can, because uh, essentially what happens is we risk ourselves to go in there and try to save as many as we're able to instead of wiping them out. Um, So let's go ahead and say that we supported the mages, and then we might actually be able to use this a little bit later um, as part of our way of uh, making our character fall a little bit. Mm -hmm. So uh, first enchanter Irving, uh, did he survive the battle against Uldred? Um, Let me see if the context tells us about Uldred. Uh, the demon possessed Uldred wanted nothing more than to break First Enchanter Irving, the leader of the Ferelden Circle of Magi. Uh, while the Elder Enchanters would uh, will would never break, his survival is not guaranteed. Um, th- I think we actually l- might as well go and let him say he died in battle. Yeah, um, I would so say like, towards that too. However, mm-hmm. when you do that, it says the choice. Oh, we have to support the Templars if we do that. That's what yeah. it looks like, which, again, I think is a kind of an oversight in the game. I think you should be able to fail in some of these. It looks like they're counting that as a successful quest, like you either succeed by going in there as the uh, trying to save the enchanter, mm. or you fail, and if you and if you side with the Templars, he dies, as opposed gotcha. to attempting it, but still having the possibility of failure, which I, I actually kind of like more. Mm-hmm. Um, but it looks like we're sort of bound for him to survive, at least mm-hmm. in this case. So. Go ahead and cancel the change then? Uh, yeah, I think okay. so. So we'll go ahead and say that First Enchanter Irving uh, survived the battle. All right, uh, Colin's request. Um, so did we agree to Colin's request to kill the mages at the tower? Um, actually, you know what? We might be able to have the best of both worlds here um, because we can say that we didn't agree to the request. We went in to try to save the mages, um, but we ended up supporting the Templars, quote unquote, because Irving didn't survive the battle. Which I think might also mean that we'd end up having to kill him, essentially. We thought that he wasn't going to... I see um, what you're saying. 
Yeah. I see. So we do, we don't accept the request to kill the mages. Mm-hmm. So we're essentially we do have to side with the Templars, but we're saying we're not going to kill the mages. And then yeah. So we we don't uh, we don't agree to this request, but we go in there. Irving dies, and if it means that we supported the Templars, quote unquote, then so be it. Okay, I like that. Cool. All right, moving right along to Dinnerum. This is, I think, the uh, the big human capital city um, in uh, in Ferelden. So, uh, Sir Landry alive. I think he um, is basically um, trying to challenge you to a duel or something. Um, convinced that the Grey Wardens were responsible for the death of King Kaelin, which is the king that you're with at the beginning of the game, but he dies um, in this big battle with the Darkspawn when um, this traitor named uh, Loghain, who we'll hear more about here in a little bit, um, uh, turned on the king and uh, withheld his troops, and basically they got overrun. Um, so, and uh, and um, Logan was able to take over the throne, um, but Sir Landry here um, thinks that we're responsible for his death, and he uh, challenged us to a duel. So, did we um, did we duel him and kill him, or did we leave him alive? Uh, I think we dueled him and killed him. I think we need to start moving in the direction of uh, going protecting a little bit darker. Honor. Yeah, well, protecting honor too, but I think that also leads us a bit down a bit a darker path. We're already beyond the halfway point in the game, gotcha. so I think we should be leading in that direction. I but think actually, not- based on this grid, it's it's perhaps in no particular order because I remember also that um, uh, the dwarves, the elves, and the werewolves, and the mages and the templars are actually you can kind of go in whatever order you want. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you're right about that. <clears throat> excuse me. So I think actually this is mostly um, in the city kind of uh, side quests. Um, Let's see, here's another thing where it can go kind of dark. Um, did the Warren tell uh, Ben Sigurd about finding Oswin in Arl Howe's torture room? Uh, basically the idea here is that I think someone who helped to betray our character's parents um, when, uh, you know, your, in your origin story as a human noble, your castle gets raided and your family gets killed and basically you barely survive and you join the wardens afterward. Um, so essentially they find this guy who is part of that and they're torturing him. We can rather tell um, this noble about his son being tortured um, and that will result in him uh, you know, being, being grateful being to us for reporting it and it will spare this guy or we can just leave him alone I think just like leave him to his fate. Well, we're leaving him to his fate um, out of a sense of revenge essentially, correct? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, which I think is, I think is probably the way that we should be leaning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I think that was the context. Um, I'm not positive it doesn't tell you here. Um, that sounds that sounds right to me. Mm-hmm. Cool. So we'll go ahead and prove that answer in any case. Mm-hmm. Clearing customers out of the pearl. Um, I would say that we'd, we'd uh, help take out these rowdy gentlemen that are uh, messing around with the bar. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, we're noticing now that we're starting to become very violent in uh, Denerim. Uh, so this might be in, in indicative of our um, character doing good things in theory, but also killing all the people. So, Violence, violence with the good reasons, technically. Mm-hmm. Even though it may not necessarily be the best choice, there is a good mm-hmm. reason behind it. Right. Um, do we want to go and do the same thing with the Crimson Ores? Yeah, I believe so. Master Ignatio's assassination missions. Um, this is kind of an interesting question. So I don't think that our warden would do the assassinations, uh, but then there's the question of do we just leave him alone and not do the missions, or do we actually kill this assassin uh, leader? I think, I think you would kill him, and the mm-hmm. reason why is because we're leaning in that direction where we're, we're doing things that we, that we feel are, are right, mm-hmm. but we're kind of... Uh, becoming more prone to violent reactions and um, we're starting to be more and more judgmental I've noticed as we're going on okay. as we're going along uh, uh, which I think is is probably a good way to sort of you dip our dip our feet into the dark path gotcha all right so we'll go with that answer Goldana this is um, the sister of um, one of our companions um, Alistair, who, yeah. Alistair, yeah, which is a uh, fellow Grey Warden, um, also uh, nobility apparently, who's uh, shirking his responsibilities. Um, <laughs> so we can either go with Din and encounter, or that we did help Alistair find her, um, or chose to not help. Um, I would think that we could help a companion. Yeah, I think so. Um, and then Margolin. Um, who is uh, Leliana's boss, essentially. Um, kind of an old mentor who um, betrayed her somehow. Um, so do we not encounter her, or do we send her away and basically protect her from Liliana, or do we end up getting her killed for Liliana? 
I'm trying to remember uh, Liliana. Which companion was she? She was um, the bard. She was a rogue. You encounter her um, in like the first kind of hub town near the beginning of the game. I'm almost leaning towards um, siding with Liliana because she's our companion and having mm -hmm. uh, Marjolaine killed for that reason. Okay, so we'll go with that. Um, incidentally, in my original playthrough, I um, just missed Liliana. Like, I, I just never met her, um, so I never recruited her. Um, so that one for me actually would have been the default, just didn't encounter. All right, so we had that character killed, and that will wrap up Dinnerum. Okie dokie, so now we're getting uh, near the climax here. Uh, the lands meet. This is a very significant sort of decision point. Um, we're deciding who rolls for Elden now, so... Um, this is based partially on a number of factors, including what happens to Loghain. Um, so we're probably gonna start running into some, com some conflicts here, depending on what we choose. And actually, I would say before before we do this decision or mm -hmm. the very final decision, um, you know, the final battle, mm -hmm. we might wanna go back and go through the companions because- Let's um, do that, yeah. There, there are options for companions, particularly, you know, Alistair, um, that, are, that might change if we choose, depending on our relationship with Alistair. Gotcha. All right, so companions. Um, romance. Did we romance anyone? Ah, so see, here we go. So here's that, here's that, um, the Lana person that we, that we talked about. That was that bard, that roguish. Mm -hmm. And then we also have, I remember Morgan. I remember a lot of these characters. I remember Alistair. I don't remember this Zevran guy. Zevran um, was an uh, assassin that, um, I don't know if you may or not have run into him. Um, but he, I think is actually meant to kill you. Um, that's like kind of his mission, but like he, you know, he can be recruited as a companion first. Um, so at one point he can actually turn on you. Mm. Um, this could actually be an interesting thing where if we were to go with this, and I'm not sure if this would nullify the ability to um, uh, kill him later, but it might be interesting if like this romance did happen and then later on he turns on you and we kill him. And that's another part of like kind of this darkening of this character. Maybe I mean I think that when you when you're starting out with an assassin character, though it seems because you've known him from the start to be an assassin, it doesn't really seem like that's the sort of person you would gravitate towards. Mm, given, yeah, I, given I, your like, noble nature not be at first, um, mm -hmm. I would I would actually lean more towards uh, Liliana simply because she seems to be sort of a um, middling, neutral, like uh, in terms of uh, morality, given that our earlier choice about having someone killed. Mm -hmm. And that could actually be why we, we went ahead and, and uh, sided with her and had that person killed, perhaps going against our sense of morality out of a um, need for loyalty to our companion. Mm -hmm. And by and large, Liliana does tend to be um, like pretty much good aligned. Um, she can be brutal in some cases. She um, Actually, she appears in Inquisition as your uh, spy master. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how much about her past she learned here, but she's kind of on... Um, like a bit of a uh, uh, soul-searching hiatus, so to speak, um, when we find her in Origins. Um, but she's like been an assassin, like raised to be one um, in the uh, Orlesian um, sort of nobility, the kind of the Game of Thrones equivalent to uh, their um, vying for power over there. Um, and then she becomes a uh, um, assistant to the Divine of the uh, Chantry. Um, so she uh, she tends to be pretty good, but also has kind of a a few sort of like you know deep dark secrets, if that makes sense. I think that's sort of a little bit similar to the way that we're going with our character. So it seems like kind of a one for one match, personally. Gotcha. So we want to go with uh, romance, Liliana. Uh, that's kind of the way I'm leaning. Either that or none. Okay. Well, let's go with that then. All right, recruited the dog. That's uh, basically a default. If you um, play as a uh, human noble, um, you're going to get the dog. So, so you, you got to recruit the dog. Come yeah, on, got to recruit the dog. Uh, Zevrin, that assassin that we we're talking about. Um, did we recruit him, or did we just leave him alone? Uh, yeah, I would say we don't even recruit him because I think, okay. given his nature, um, I, I think it just wouldn't really jive with our character. So we'll gotcha. probably just not even bother with him at all. All right, and then Wynn was a mage we would have encountered in the uh, in the um, Circle Tower. So um, since we're going in there with the intention of hoping to save the mages, I would think that we would probably recruit her. Okay, remember that we did side with the Templars. Well, we, we sided because um, the end result was killing um, the first enchanter. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think what might happen here is that like on our way up there, because we didn't agree to wipe out the mages, um, we decided to recruit this one as we were fighting all the, the demons, but then um, didn't end up uh, being able to save the enchanter. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. So we recruited Wynn. Um, now the question is, is she alive and well, or did she end up dying? Um, so, I, I'm sort of, the way that I'm leaning currently, maybe maybe she could die, but I'm sort of leaning towards, you know, maybe she survived, maybe not, but mm -hmm. um, that that Leliana, the one who that we're in the romance with, might not survive. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if there's any point at which she would die, but maybe we'll uh, we'll see what happens. There's actually, um, let's see, there is one here that says that she's upset by the way that we deal with the urn. But you're right; it looks like she can't actually die mm -hmm. unless um, unless we poison the urn, which we did not do. Yeah, and uh, also we could have killed Wen when we poisoned the urn because she would have fought us for over that. But um, I know I kind of like this idea of recruiting this person, then she dies with the uh, the broken circle. Okay. Um, so let's go with that. Oh no! Wait a minute, though. Oh, then we wouldn't have recruited. Uh, do we want to go with her dying at the circle and not recruiting? Yeah, let's. Go. I think we should go with that. Okay. That kind of, that kind of makes that whole um, that that mage tower uh, infiltration with the Templars a pretty dark time for us. Gotcha. We have all these people kind of dying around us. Mm -hmm. um, Morgan and the baby. This is a this is a fun one. So near the end of the game, uh, Morgan approaches you and lets you know that hey, there's this um, really weird dark magic ritual that we can do um, to make it so that you don't have to die when you kill the archdemon. Um, so basically, she wants to have a child with you, and that child would be an old god that would basically um, have the spirit of the archdemon within it, um, which would mean that killing the archdemon in its current um, incarnation would not um, actually make it die. So um, there's this dark ritual that she wants to do. Um, so there's a few different options we have here. Either yeah. the warden can have the baby with Morgan, um, Morgan can have that, that baby with out. Alistair. Um, Morgan can uh, Morgan have that baby with uh, Loghain, which is uh, something that if we were to go with that, we might have to see what happens at the uh, the lands meet. Or uh, Morgan had a human baby with the warden, which I think is just um, I, we didn't romance Morgan, so I don't think that that would happen. Right. Um. When when does she approach you with this choice? Pretty much like the night before the final battle. Okay. It's, it's very so close then, to the end of the game. So then this so, might be where we sort of have to make a um, maybe not the best decision because it mm -hmm. seems like this is not really a good decision to have this child. Right. Uh, but maybe um, you think it's necessary. So I'm thinking I'm leaning towards the um, Alistair or Loghain option. So let's maybe um, leave this alone for now and uh, go back to the uh, the lands meet here in a second and figure out what happened there. Um, so we'll like address what happens to Logan and that sort of thing, and then we'll come back to this and sort of see what we want to do. Okay. Um, so here it looks like the default is that Logan is executed by the warden. Um, again, Logan being the guy who betrayed the king and uh, currently is the king. Kind of a uh, usurper. usurper. Um, but he tries to explain that he's doing it for good reasons because the other king was foolish and would have gotten everyone killed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we can either say that Logan was executed by uh, Alistair um, that he was executed by the warden, um, that he and Logan dueled, uh, Alistair and Logan, that is, dueled, and Logan was killed. Um, we can also recruit Logan, and um, in that event, um, we'd probably lose Alistair's loyalty because he doesn't want to be on your team if Logan's going to be on your team. Um, but Logan could actually kill the Archdemon, and he would die doing that. Uh, or. Um, we could recruit Loghain and actually just have him on our team. So I actually had an interesting situation in my original playthrough where um, I wanted to be merciful, um, so I didn't want to kill him. I didn't want him to go unpunished, but I didn't want to kill him. Um, and Alistair didn't agree with that, and he basically left the party because he was upset by that. Um, so what are we thinking for our character at this point? And this is this is uh, later in the game, Yeah. Uh, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking, I'm thinking we might just go ahead and um, execute him. To be honest, mm -hmm. given how we're, we sort of descended into this sort of violent response to uh, what we feel are uh, bad people, mm -hmm. seems like something we might do. 
Gotcha. All right, so we went ahead and executed him. So just kind of very, um, you did wrong, we kill you, that sort of thing. Right. You bad, so, we kill. Yeah, you bad, we kill. So we went ahead and executed Loghain. Um, and then Alistair, um, what happened to him? So either he can die killing the Archdemon, um, he can be executed, um, he can become king, he can stay with the Wardens, or he can become a drunk. So what are we thinking? That's, I think, given that we, well, we did kill Loghain also. So I'm thinking mm -hmm. um, we, we still need to figure out how we're going to be dealing with the, um, the Archdemon. And mm -hmm. if our character is alive, and if we're not doing the whole, although we might do the God Baby thing, I was going to say he might, Alistair might die uh, during the Archdemon attack. Uh, it would give our character a bit more uh, pathos so that they would uh, continue down their, their darker path. So are we thinking that he dies killing the Archdemon then? Uh, yes. Well, okay. if we do that, then the God Baby's decision is out because uh, I'm a little confused. Yeah, if he dies killing the Archdemon, then the God Baby is out. Yeah, I think, I guess, I guess no then, because I, I kind of like the God Baby choice. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing we can do, actually, is um, at one point, the, he becomes king by marrying um, the current heir to the throne, which I actually believe is Loghain's daughter. Um, so if he were to marry her, and he's against it, like he doesn't want to be married against his will, um, but you can basically like force him to by talking him into it. Um, so if he becomes king, um, that's still kind of a like we're making him like you know do something he doesn't want to for the greater good, which I think is a bit of a dick move, um, even though it's for a good cause. However, I, when I just clicked on that, it looks like you have to die to kill when you kill the archdemon. Hmm. Oh wait, maybe that's because of the other choice though. Let's go back to the God Baby and, and switch, pick one of the God Baby issues, and then probably then Alistair could become king and not die. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's try that real quick. So, um, Morgan, <laughs> the, the baby, God, God Baby, <laughs> um, <laughs> old God Baby. It just, I, I love that rolls off the yeah. tongue. Um, so, does she have the baby with uh, Alistair or with the uh, the Warden? Definitely not with the Warden, and I guess it can't be with Logan because Logan is dead. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking it's, it, it has to be um, Alistair. Okay, and I got because I actually said Alistair's king, and then Alistair has the God Baby, and now the Warden is also alive and well. So. Yeah, and I see that here when it says yes, make the changes. So yeah, it looks like when you do that, Alistair rules, and Alistair became king. So yeah, it sort of it actually answers a couple of other questions for us, so we don't have to go back to them. So that's that, and then we'll uh, go in and just wrap up the uh, Lands Meet and the Battle of Dinnerham real quick. Um, well, Lance, which I think Lands Meet was already chosen for us. Mm -hmm. uh, via our choice with Alistair becoming king. So mm -hmm. now we're... Although, then there's the question, though, is it Alistair and um, Anora? Did they get married, or is it just Alistair? Oh, that's true. Okay. The other thing, too, is there might be a certain situation in which um, we actually become king. The Warden does. No, it's not one of the... Op well, that's not one of the options. It, 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 unless we marry um, Anora, it looks like. Mm -hmm. But in, in which case, they would it would undo Alistair being king, right? So our, we really only have two choices here. Mm -hmm. um, actually, if this will let us, I'm actually kind of a fan of um, making him king through marriage um, because that's kind of another one of those things where our character is making good things happen by whatever means necessary. Yeah, I agree, and it does look like it. At least it let me. So I, I think mm -hmm. we've made. I've tried to make the same decisions as we go cool. along. All right, so it looks like that uh, that worked. And then the Battle of Dinnerum, basically just who killed the Archdemon. Um, I could see us actually killing the Archdemon, so it's not going to kill us and we claim all the glory, um, and we don't die because there's the old God Baby. Right, yeah, God Baby's got our back. Cool. Thank you, God Baby. <laughs> Thank you, old God Baby. Ye old um, God Baby. Uh, Dragon Age 2, and we'll just try to go through this fairly quickly. There are fewer choices, as I recall, in this one. Um, so our hero... Um, it might be interesting to mix things up a little bit and actually make this character a mage. Um, I don't know what you think of that, Jim. Yeah, that's, that works for me. Um, cool. Garrett Hawk, the mage. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're going with? Uh, yeah, do we want to do that or do we want to go with uh, Marion Hawk? Well, I mean, it's, it's up to you. I know, as I said before, when I play these games, I tend to pick someone that is more like me. Mm -hmm. So I would probably go with... Um, the Garrett Hawk, but if you want to do the uh, Marion just to kind of see the differences there, that's also fine. 
Cool. Let's uh, let's go with that, and we'll uh, represent our uh, our female fan base as well. They can have some representation here. Um, and then the other question is, uh, what is our character's personality? Do they tend to be diplomatic, uh, humorous, kind of like you know neutral Joker type, or um, aggressive, very sort of like forceful and um, like you know not taking shit from anyone? Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. I see the choice now. Hawk's personality, right? Um, I'm I'm kind of leaning towards the humorous. Humorous, yeah, because then we can kind of make whatever choices we want without like not that aggressive can't be good and not that dim- diplomatic can't be bad, but I kind of like the idea that the humorous one is just kind of whatever all the time. Prologue. Um, so how did we get into Kirkwall? Um, so basically, all of Dragon Age Two takes place in Kirkwall, um, and you're kind of there because you l- left your home during the blight. So, did we get in through the smugglers or through the mercenaries? I'm thinking actually smugglers might work because um, since we're mages, um, we're trying to kind of keep a low profile mages, um, especially ones that aren't part of the circle. We're um, we're not exactly uh, friendly with the government. Yeah, I agree with that. Cool. So we joined the smugglers. Um, Act one. So there's some Templars who are trying to. Um, capture some mages that ran away from the circle um we can either fight against the templars convince the templars to leave or turn the mages over to the templars um so i guess it kind of depends our character um isn't necessarily aggressive but that doesn't mean that we can't make aggressive choices um how how do we feel about the templars because i actually think it might be an interesting kind of twist if we have this mage character who's actually all for the templars and the circle and kind of like the order of things and wants to be um, even though a mage herself, she wants to like make sure that order reigns and not um, like you know maybe even self fearful to a degree. So she sees the the Templars as kind of this necessary evil to uh, protect the the mages, even though they might sometimes be overbearing. Yeah, that might be. I was thinking that might be interesting. Okay, sure. Um, in which case, we in in this instance um, might actually go ahead and turn the mages over to the Templars. Yeah. Traitorous mage. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see here. Seamus. Did Hawk return Seamus safely to the Viscount? So basically, do we try to return this guy to this guy who hired us to go find him, or do we um, uh, just take him out? Or just not seek him out at all? Uh, I only have two options here. Either we mm-hmm. don't return him, I oh, just don't seek him out, I see. Yeah, I, maybe we just don't seek him out at all. Okay. And that would mean that uh, Janus or Guinness is alive and well. This is the leader of the mercenaries who is trying to um, track him down. So if he was alive, we would have had to kill her. So mm-hmm. we can probably say that this is a pretty uh, apathetic hawk. So we can say that um, we didn't look like maybe most of the time we just don't do side quests. <laughs> uh, so like didn't look for Gislaine's wife, um, all that sort of stuff. There's there's no option for like when when asked to look for the wife we just sort of like crack a joke and then move on. <laughs> Maybe well that could be very well the uh, reason or the way in which we declined the quest. Um, I don't think it's a listed option, um, but it's kind of implied by our uh, characters thing. Um, so either we could not tell the truth about the wife's death or tell the truth, or again just didn't even look. Yeah, I'd say not didn't look. We didn't look. Okay. We we told some really bad joke and they told us to get lost. <laughs> Kelder, uh, so this whole thing. Um, Kelder Vineyard, or Vineyard was the son of a magistrate in the city of Kirkwall. He was fixated on elves and murdered several of them, claiming the demons in his head, or claiming the demons in his head forced him to do so. Um, so is he alive? Did we just return him to his father, or did we kill him? Uh, I mean, I'm leaning towards killing him. It seems like a good choice to me. Mm. We, um, we don't like demons. No, <laughs> so. I would say no, and it does seem... Well, our character's not really a bad person, just kind of self-serving. Mm-hmm. And this self-serving and maybe a little bit uh, self-loathing to an extent, mm-hmm. so, which is contradictory, but it can happen. Self-hating so. mage. Yep. <laughs> All right. Sir Thrask, did we blackmail? Um, blackmail's always fun. Uh, let's see. Hawk, Hawk used Sir Thrask's apostate daughter against the Templar. So, yeah, we've been known to not necessarily like take pity on mages. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can say, like, hey, we know your daughter's a mage. Um, and, and yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that we're, we're kind of going for a um, sort of a self serving playthrough, uh, mm-hmm. and blackmailing uh, Sir Trask is definitely in our personal benefit. Mm-hmm. So I would say, yeah, definitely. Cool. All right. Um, Iduna, the exotic wonder from the east. 
Aduna was a blood mage involved in a plot to corrupt Kirkwall's Templar units. Um, I'd actually say that we'd probably get her killed um, because if our character is kind of afraid of mages, blood mages kind of represent like among the worst that aren't you know abominations. Right. Um, they they like really mess around with the dangerous powers and stuff like that. So yeah, I'd say we'd probably let her get killed or kill her ourselves, depending. This is a um, a mage, an elf mage. Um, basically, you can choose to send them to the Dalish to learn um, from the elves. Um, it's kind of like the the freer choice. Or we can send them to the circle, which I think our character would do. Um, Given how we she, are so fearful of mm -hmm. the mage's power. Yeah. So send them to the circle. Mm -hmm. All right. Defended Ketajan from the Kunari. Did we or didn't we not? Um, I'd say we'd probably hand him over. Um, we don't want to risk our necks for a stranger. Um, so we'd probably give him back to the Canari just to keep the peace and not, you know, do anything too uh, risky. Yeah. Act du. An Arlesian noble named Gascard claimed he was trying to investigate a series of disappearances of women around Kirkwall. Um, didn't kill Gascard or um, killed Gascard while ultimately not responsible for the disappearances. Gascard's methods for quote unquote protecting them were unsavory. Um, yeah, I don't think we'd find unsavory methods worth sparing him. So um, we'd probably go in and kill him. All right. There's no um, let get, like blackmail Gascard or <laughs> no. I just didn't kill him or let him or it, we did kill him. So I'd say we kill him. All right. Varnell and the Kunari. So I, this is a thing where the Templars are about to fight the Kunari. Um, the Kunari are kind of like these foreign visitors who just sort of like set up shop in the town. Um, they were allowed to stay there, but then like over time they start to um, become more and more of a nuisance. Um, but I, I think that we don't want trouble, and so I say we'd probably not side with them. Yeah, we don't want no trouble. We don't want no trouble. Uh, this is another thing where she's trying to mess with the Canari. Um, I'd say we did not side with Patrice no, in stay, her plot we, to we mess stay with out them. of it. Stay out of it. We're staying out of it. Did Hawk discover who was raiding Hubert's caravans? No, because we're lazy. <laughs> so Javaris Tentop was an enterprising dwarf determined to earn learn the secret of the Gatlock, the Canari explosive black powder formula. So I think that she we'd probably just kill him. Um, we'd probably hunt him down, and then either like we leave him alone and hunt down the true thief, or we um, he gets th or framed, and we just hold him responsible for causing all this trouble and just go ahead and kill him. Right. Either way, he dies, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he doesn't die necessarily. Um, it's just a question of do we care enough to hunt down the true thief, or do we just sort of like make a show of killing him? I think probably kill him. Kill him. All right. This is a very uh, bloody world state that we're creating. I like it. <laughs> All right. Lieutenant Harley. Um, again, probably. Actually, no, I like Abandoned. this. Abandoned. So there's these, there's these raiders trying to hunt down this uh, this mage, I guess. Um, or the, the entrenched raiders. So we can either help the guardsmen um, or um, we can actually just abandon them. I, I so, like that one. We just kind of like see it. We're like, ah, pass. Later. Yeah. <laughs> Later. All right. Vainreel is an, an alienage elf. That's the uh, kind of like the slum elves that I mentioned earlier, um, who had a powerful but untrained magical abilities. Um, so we probably don't like him very much. Right. Um, he ran away from the Circle of Magi. Um, I think we'd probably favor making him tranquil, basically making him unable to use magic anymore. Yeah. Um, which kind of like steals his soul in a way, but... Um, that's probably what we would do. He wasn't really using it. Not properly, anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the Arashok. Um, this is going to affect some companion decisions. The Arashok is the leader of the Canari. Um, basically, if we don't make peace with him, it's kind of inevitable. Or if you don't appease him, I should say, it's inevitable that you're going to have to fight him and kill him. Um, I'm actually kind of a fan for our character of just like not wanting to be bothered, taking any means necessary to keep the peace. Um, probably say did not kill the air shock and found a way to peacefully um, resolve that situation. Okay, I so think we'll go in and, sorry, I, go I was going to say I think that before we do Act Three, uh, we should you know return to companions and go through not those choices since cool. that that might impact um, how we resolve things in Act Three. All right. Um, so did Hawk romance? Um, I'm actually um, leaning toward no. Um, it's kind of have like the sarcastic like doesn't even care sort of thing um i could see that kind of like somewhat of a, a loner type that mm -hmm. is a little bit too caught up in, in herself to really uh reach out to any anyone else and perhaps too uh too conflicted 
too self-conflicted mm-hmm. to uh, over being a mage and not liking mages to not really want to do that. So yeah, we'll go with no and romanced. Um, Bethany is always going to die because we're a mage. Um, so then there's the question of Carver, um, our brother. Um, so Carver can uh, become a Templar, become a Grey Warden, or he can die in the Deep Roads. Um, I actually think it could be interesting since we seem to favor Templars if uh, he um, joins the Templar Order, and that's another reason that we might try to support them. Yeah, I can see All that. Right. I can see that as well. So Carver became a Templar. Varric, were we friends with Varric or were we rivals? I actually think that we kind of be friends, um, even though we're making some weird choices. I think that we would get along with Varric because he's kind of like this lovable roguish type. Yeah, I think so. Is, so, is right, Garrick, I don't remember Garrick. Was he a um, a dwarf or something? He was a dwarf, yeah. Okay. He was a storyteller was kind of his uh, his thing. The game opens up with him being interrogated by oh, this oh, um, right. seeker from yeah, the Chantry. Yeah, I, I remember that now, actually. Mm-hmm. Bartrand. Do we kill him, basically put him out of his misery, which I actually think that Varric uh, prefers at the time, or do we try to talk Varric out of killing him and just letting him kind of like live in madness? I think we'd probably just kill him. Yes, it's the easier choice. Mm -hmm. We're also afraid of strange things that do magic stuffs. Mm -hmm. So So it looks like um, the next option that we have here is that we're able to recruit uh, Korra, uh, the current avatar into our team. <laughs> um, oh no! Wait, uh, it's El- Isabella. Never mind. Isabella looks very similar. Yeah, same color um, scheme too. I actually think that we do need to recruit Isabella because um, we need her to return to Hawk so that we can give her to the Arishok because um, she stole this uh, sacred item from the uh, Kunari. And basically, the only way to peacefully resolve this is to turn Isabella over to them. Um, and if we don't give her over, then they attack. So yeah. very, very different. But also something that we would do because it is the easiest way to resolve the conflict. Yes. And she did steal a thing. So Fenris, I forget how he feels about mages, but I don't think we 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 don't like slavers. We already established. Um, well, he, and, yeah, right. And he's a slave, so I would think we would um, at least try to recruit him. Mm-hmm. So I think maybe what we can do is say that he's alive, but he's still pursued. Um, so we were too lazy to help him, like get people off of his back. Um, but we still decided to help him, like, the way, in general. Yeah, I agree. And I think the way that I see it is that uh, we told him that we would help him because uh, we wanted his help on, on our missions. Mm-hmm. And then when the time came to help him, we were like, nah, I don't really feel like doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. All right, so did Meryl stay with Hawk? Um, after being expelled from her clan, uh, she used controversial methods to uncover forgotten elven magic that caused conflict. Um, I actually think that we would um, not have her join forces. Um, we don't like the fact that she's screwing around with weird magics. I agree. So Anders attacks the Chantry. This is kind of like the beginning of um, what sparks the uh, the mage revolution that happens near the end of the game. Um, I would say that we did not approve of this. Um, we don't like the fact that he blew up the Chantry. Um, so I'm going to go with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say, actually, we'd probably go in and execute Anders, too, because he's out of control. Yep. We can't risk it. We don't like dim crazy mages. Um, Aveline, did she marry Dominic or Donic? Um, I'd say, yeah. Basically, like you, you sort of helped to get them together um, through like a side quest. And I'd say that you know we like our companions. And so... Um, so we no did reason. bother to help out this time. Yeah, maybe we did. Or do we want to go in and skip that and say no? I don't know. So far, we, we've really taken this standoffish approach to all of these choices where we're just mm-hmm. kind of, unless we see some sort of like benefit for us, we're not really doing them. Not really directly, so, no. There, you actually kind of have to go out of your way. So Yeah, I would kind of lean towards we just don't bother. All right. So Aveline did not marry. Um, did Aveline stay with Hawk? Um, um, I'd say gonna, so. If, so. If she marries Donic, does that cause her to leave? No, I don't think so. Uh, I was going to say that could be our um, impetus for not getting them together because we want to keep um, Aveline with us so that we mm-hmm. can you know, reap the benefits ourselves. Yeah. Um, I'd say we didn't recruit Sebastian because we're lazy bastards. No. Talus. Talus was an elven agent of the Canari. Um, her Canari loyalties made her life and uh, perspectives quite different than those of the champions. We weren't actually against the Canari, so I don't think we would have made her angry. Didn't make her angry and didn't kiss because we didn't care. Um, yeah. So yeah. We just don't care about a lot. Mm-hmm. But I, I agree with you, though. I think that's, that's perfectly right. acceptable. And now we just have um, Act 3. Act 3. So did we help Nuncio find the assassin? Um, no. We just don't care. 
didn't bother. Um, and therefore, we didn't find Zevran, um, who was the guy that, of course, we didn't recruit in the last game. So our uncle, who's a bit of a dick, um, when you first meet him, like he's basically blown the family inheritance, and that's why we have to kind of like scrape out a living on the streets at first. So we don't um, like this guy at all, then. Yeah, so I'd say we just didn't help him. I agree with that. There's no kill him option, and no strange. <laughs> no, Emil. I'd say we send him back to the circle. Um, we don't like mages getting ideas, so we sent him back. Yeah. A group of mages and Templars work together to overthrow Knight Commander Meredith. Huh. This is a good question, actually. Um, so we find the conspirators, and this is both mages and Templars. Do we hand them over to the commander of the Templars, or do we hand them over to Orsino, who um, is the first enchanter, and therefore, I'm pretty sure, a circle mage? So I think we wouldn't, at this point, have any problem with Orsino. Probably not, although we are... Yeah, I, I, I could see that. So we have been pretty I presented the conspiracy to Orsino, allowing the first enchanter to deal with them away from Templar eyes. Yeah, I think that works for me. Cool. And that kind of helps to... Uh, reduce some tension too because at this point the act three is all about this tension between the mages and the templars so sided with mages this is a big decision um so did the hawk side with the mages and the templars in the final battle uh, i'm thinking templars yeah to kind they of don't go like, with our, we don't like rebelling mages and plus it kind of goes with our self-hating mage uh character mm -hmm. oh the dragon the dragon we didn't kill the dragon because <laughs> screw killing dragons we're, we're lazy we pass on killing the dragon pass yeah. So, hey, do you want to go kill the dragon? Yeah. No. Have you seen a dragon? They're pretty big. <laughs> and so there we have it. That's our uh, that's our backward compatible world state. Um, our uh, good guy turned bad guy sort of warden character, and then our self loathing hawk character. So um, any uh, closing thoughts here, Jim? Uh, none except for uh, it did definitely seem like you had, and this is my experience with Dragon Age as well. Um, you had a lot more choices, and you felt like you had more agency in the world in Dragon Age Origins than you did in Dragon Age 2. I tend to agree, yeah. Um, Dragon Age 2 um, felt a lot more linear and yeah. a lot less like you could really control what happened. I mean, they had some interesting kind of like... They, they, what they did do fairly well um, was they had like kind of interesting... Um, dichotomy sort of choices or just sort of like tough choices where like you have to decide the fate of like, you know, this person. Um, but it didn't feel as meaningful as it did in Dragon Age Origins to me. Yeah, I mean, they, they did. It did have that uh, the sort of split with the um, the Templars and the Mages as we were going through those choices it was extra interesting for us because of our Templar loyalty, uh, despite being a mage. So mm -hmm. that was that was interesting. But at the same time, we really didn't have a lot of um, there wasn't a lot of differences in the choices. We just had a couple different variations, and they were very um, polarized. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely very polarized in here. Whereas in Origins, we had a lot more um, things could end several different ways. So, uh, anywho, it's about time for us to wrap up. I think. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining us for uh, perhaps a slightly longer than usual uh, backward compatible podcast number sixteen. Uh, I'm Chris, and uh, I'm joined once again by Jim. Yep. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your custom Dragon Age world state, and whether you might give ours a try. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.